and to remember that in the past, those who foolishly sought power by riding the back of the tiger ended up inside. Gilgamesh and the Beast, E.R. Barney The most important of the various mythological portions underlying the Gilgamesh myth is probably that concerning E.R. Barney, who is a type of primitive man, living among the beasts of the field as one of them. But he is also, according to certain authorities, a form of a sun god, the same as Gilgamesh himself, and like the hero of Erech, he rises to the zenith of his powers in a celebration, then descends into the underworld. He is not lost sight of, however, but lives in memory in his friend Gilgamesh. And in the twelfth tablet, he is temporarily brought forth from the underworld, that is, his ghost, or Utuki, which in a dim and shadowy fashion may typify the daily restoration of the sun although you may remember the Udduk or Utuku are demons. In exorcism texts, the good Udduk is sometimes invoked against an evil Udduk. The word is generally ambiguous and is sometimes used to refer to demons as a whole rather than a specific type of demon. No visual representations of the Udduk have yet been identified because in the beginning they were spirits, but descriptions of it ascribe to it features often given to ancient Mesopotamian demons. A dark shadow, absence of light surrounding it, poison, and a deafening voice. This would also be a word-for-word -word description for the divine storm bird, Zu, and the seven Anunnaki. It is worth noting here that the father of Gilgamesh in the account by Elian is Shamash, who is also known as Utu, and Utuku, Utukai, is possibly a plural form. The Udug, the Utuku, it hides away, taking refuge. It does not stand proudly. An unknown god, disguised in a veil of light. The demon is nameless and formless, even in its early appearances. Remember that the first add-on to the Pantheon is Abzu. Before this he was nameless and formless. The name Abzu belonged to the original God concept. So whatever unknown figure that is now in the role of Abzu originally had no name or form. Another important stratum of the myth is that which concerns Utnapishtim the Babylonian Noah, but whereas the myth of Iarbani and Gilgamesh, though still distinguishable, have become thoroughly fused. The deluge story, of which Utnapishtim is the hero, has been inserted boldly into the eleventh tablet of the epic. Being related to Gilgamesh by Utnapishtim himself, he has the attributes and powers of God. Having received these for his fidelity towards the gods during the flood, from whose waters he was the sole survivor. Those waters were brought on by the flood storm weapon, the ultimate weapon of the Anunnaki, and that would be the Anzu bird, who alone I name Udug, for he is legion, many names and many faces. The object of his narrative in the Gilgamesh epic seems to be to point out to the hero that only the most exceptional circumstances, unique circumstances, can save man from his doom. Now being the son of the Floodstorm weapon appears to be the only exception. Other distinct portions of the epic are 
the battle with the monster Kumbaba, the episode of Ishtar's love for Gilgamesh, the fight with the sacred bull of Anu, and the search for the plant of life. These, whatever their origin, have become naturally incorporated with the story of Gilgamesh. But besides the various historical and mythical elements presented, there is also a certain amount of Babylonian religious doctrine evident to some extent in the 11th tablet, which points to the moral, if you can call it that, that all men must die. But this is not so in the 12th tablet, wherein the shade of Iarbani appears to Gilgamesh and relates the misfortunes of the unburied dead or of those uncared for after death, and to implant care for the deceased, as the only means whereby they may avoid the grievous woes which threaten them in the underworld. Let us examine in detail the Gilgamesh epic as we have it in the broken fragments which remain. The first and second tablets are mutilated. A number of fragments are extant, which belong to one or other of these two. But it is not easy to say where the first ends and the second begins. One fragment would seem to contain the very beginning of the first tablet. A sort of general preface to the epic, comprising a list of the advantages to be derived from reading it. After this comes a fragment, whose title as to its inclusion in the epic is doubtful. It describes a siege of the city of Arek, but makes no mention of Gilgamesh. The woeful condition of Arek under siege is thus picturesquely described. She asses tread down their young, cows turn upon their calves, men cry aloud like beasts, and maidens mourn like doves. The gods of the strong-walled Arek are changed to flies and buzz about the streets. The spirits of the strong-walled Arek are changed to serpents and glide into holes. For three years, the enemy besieged Arek, and the doors were barred, and the boats were shot, and Ishtar did not raise her head against the foe. Could this be the Fomorians? Heading east, fee fi fo of man. If this fragment is indeed a portion of the Gilgamesh epic, we have no means of ascertaining whether Gilgamesh was the besieger or the raiser of the siege, or whether he was concerned in the affair at all. Unless this earth hero was defending a wreck and later become merged with Gilgamesh. Now we come to the commencement of the epic inscribed on a fragment, which some authorities assign to the beginning of the second tablet, but which more probably forms a part of the first tablet. In this portion, we find Gilgamesh filling the double role of ruler and oppressor of a wreck. The latter, evidently not consistent at all with the character of a hero. Ninurta Marduk Merodak is also known as Double Seed, milk for babes and meat for men. He was once an oppressor, but now the ruler and defender, the roots of which never change. There is no mention here of a siege, nor is there any record of the coming of Gilgamesh though, as has been indicated, he probably came as a conqueror. His intolerable tyranny towards the people of Arek lends colour to this view. He presses the young men into his service, in the building of a great wall, and carries off the fairest maidens to his court. He has not left the son to his father, nor the maid to the hero, nor the wife to her husband, Finally, his harshness constrained the people to appeal to the gods, 
and they prayed to the goddess, Aruru, to create a mighty hero who would champion their cause, and through fear of whom Gilgamesh should be forced to temper his severity. The gods themselves added their prayers to those of the oppressed people, and Aruru at length agreed to create a champion against Gilgamesh. Upon hearing these words, so runs the narrative. Aruru conceived a man in the image of Anu in her mind. Aruru washed her hands. She broke off a piece of clay. She cast it on the ground. Thus, she created Iobani, the hero. When the creation of this champion was finished, his appearance was that of the wild man of the mountains. I thought Anu was a personification of the sky. The true image of Anu appears to be that of a wild man with horns. Very interesting. The whole of his body covered with hair. He was clothed in long hair like a woman. His hair was luxuriant, like that of a corn god. It sounds like cousin It from the Adams family, a DARPA. He knew not the land and the inhabitants thereof. He was clothed with garments as the god of the field. With the gazelles he ate herbs. With the beasts he shaked his thirst. Now this is very interesting and revealing true character. With the creatures of the waters, his heart rejoiced. In pictorial representations found on cylinder seals and elsewhere, Iabani is depicted as a sort of satyr, with the head, arms and body of a man, and the horns, ears and legs of a beast. As we have seen, he is a type of beast man, a sort of Caliban ranging with the beasts of the field, utterly ignorant of all things of civilization. The beguiling of Iyabani also appears as instructions on how to tame a wild man or free man into a civilization. A kingdom without its people is merely a castle, and even the words of Iyabani implanting the idea to care for the dead actually triggers the trade in death, does it not? Of course it does. Moving on, the epic goes on to introduce a new character, Tesedu, the hunter, but the title hunter can also mean king. Tesedu was apparently designed by the gods to bring about the meeting of Iabani and Gilgamesh. How he first encounters Iabani is not clear from the mutilated text. One reading has it that he was king of Erek, learning the plan of the gods for his overthrow sent Tselu into the mountains in search of Iabani, with instructions to entrap him by any means and bring him back to Erek. Another reading describes the encounter as purely accidental. However, this may be that Tselu returned to Erek and related to Gilgamesh the story of his encounter, telling him of the strength and speed of the wild man and his exceeding shyness at the sight of a human being by this time it is evident that Gilgamesh knows or conjectures the purpose of which Iyabani was designed and intends to frustrate the divine plans by anticipating a meeting between himself and the wild man. Accordingly, he bids Tseru return to the mountains, taking with him Okhot, one of the sacred women of the Temple of Ishtar. Okhot may actually be Samkat, which means the women referenced here are actually plants. I remind you that Samkat is a narcotic, so this reference to Okhot may be in reference to the Lotus Eaters. The plan of Gilgamesh is that Okhot, with her wiles, shall persuade Iarbani to return with her to Erek. The meaning of wiles, devious or cunning stratagems, employed in manipulating or persuading someone, 
Eobani was tricked into a civilized life. Thus, the hunter and the girl set out. They took the straight road, and on the third day, they reached the usual drinking place of E.R. Barney. Then Tesedo and the woman placed themselves in hiding. For one day, for two days, they lurked by his drinking place. With the beasts, E.R. Barney quenched his thirst. With the creatures of the waters, his heart rejoiced. Then E.R. Barney approached. The scene which is described at some length. Okut had no difficulty in enthralling E. Arbani with the snares of her beauty. And this is where it relates to the Lotus Eaters once again, if I am right that Okut is Sam Cat. For six days and seven nights, he remembered nothing because of his love for her. The men of Odysseus in the Greek myth remembered nothing of home because basically they were off their bloody nuts, stotting, intoxicated with the lotus flower, possibly Samkat or Okhot. When at length he bethought of his gazelles, his flocks and herds, he found that they would no longer follow him as before. So he sat at the feet of Okhot, while she told him of a wreck and its king. Thou art handsome, Eabani, you are like a god. Why do you traverse the plain with the beasts? Come, I will take you to the strong-walled Arek, to the bright palace, the dwelling of Anu and Ishtar, to the palace of Gilgamesh, who like a mountain bull wieldeth power over man. Eabani found the prospect delightful. He longed for the friendship of Gilgamesh and declared himself willing to follow the woman to the city of Arek. And so, Okhut, Eabani, and Sedu set out on their journey. The Feast of Ishtar was in progress when they reached Arek. Eabani had conceived the idea that he must do battle with Gilgamesh before he could claim that hero as a friend. But being warned, whether in a dream or by Okhut, is not clear. But if Okhut is Samkat, it is possibly a dream vision. But being warned that Gilgamesh was stronger than he, and overall a favorite of the gods, he wisely refrained from combat. The seed of doubt is most certainly an effective tool. Meanwhile, Gilgamesh also had a dream vision, which, interpreted by his mother, Rimat Belit, foretold the coming of Iabani. The part of the epic which deals with the meeting of Gilgamesh and Iabani is unfortunately no longer extant. But from the fragments which take up the broken narrative, we gather that they met and became friends. The portion of the epic next in order appears to belong to the second tablet. In these we find Eobani lamenting the loss of his former freedom and showering maledictions on the temple maiden who has lured him there. That would be Okhot. But the word maledictions is a magical word or phrase uttered with the intentions of bringing about evil or a curse. However, Shamash intervenes, perhaps in another dream or vision. These play a prominent part in the narrative, Anu showing him the benefits he has derived from his sojourn in the haunt of civilization. It's a very odd line, isn't it? The haunt of civilization. Anu endeavors with various promises and inducements to make him stay in Iraq. Now Gilgamesh, thy friend and brother, shall give thee a couch carefully prepared, shall give thee a seat at his left hand, and the kings of earth will kiss thy feet. With this, apparently, Eobani is satisfied. He ceases to bewail his position at Iraq and accepts his destiny with calmness. In the remaining fragments of the tablet, we find him concerned about another dream or vision. And before this portion of the epic closes, the two heroes have planned an expedition against the monster Kumbaba, guardian of the abode of the goddess Ilnina, who is a variant form of Ishtar in the forest of the Cedars. In the very mutilated third tablet, 
The two heroes go on to consult the priestess, Rimat Balit, the mother of Gilgamesh, and through her they ask for protection from Shamash in the forthcoming expedition. The old priestess advises her son and his friend how to proceed, and after they have gone we see her alone in the temple, her hands raised to the sun god invoking his blessing on Gilgamesh. Why have you troubled the heart of my son, Gilgamesh? You have laid your hand upon him, and he goes away on a far journey to the dwelling of Kumbaba. He entered into combat, whose issue he knows not. He follows the road unknown to him, till he arrive, and till he return, till he reaches the forest of the cedars, till he has slain the terrible Kumbaba and rid the land of all the evil that you hate, till the day of his return. Let Aya, the betrothed, your splendor, recall him to thee. With this dignified and beautiful appeal, the tablet comes to an end. The fourth tablet is concerned with the description of the monster with whom the heroes are about to do battle, Kumbaba, whom Bel had appointed to guard the cedar. One particular cedar, which appears to be of greater height and sanctity than the others. Kumbaba is a creature with a most terrifying aspect, the very presence of whom in the forest makes those who enter it weak and impotent. As the heroes draw near, Iabani complains that his hands are feeble and his arms without strength, but Gilgamesh speaks words of encouragement. It may be noted in passing that the word Kumbaba is also of Elamite origin, a fact that has led certain authorities to identify the monster with an Elamite dynasty, which in ancient times dominated Iraq, and which came to grief, came to an end in 2250 BC. It is difficult, if not impossible, to establish the connection with the mythical encounter and a definite historic event but it may be at least presumed that the bestowal of an Elamite designation on the monster Kumbaba argues a sort of enmity between Elam and Babylon. The next fragments bring us to the fifth tablet. The heroes, having reached a verdant mountain, paused to survey the forest of the cedars. When they entered the forest, the death of Kumbaba was foretold to one or other or the both of them in a dream. They hastened forwards to the combat. Unfortunately, the text of the actual encounter has not been preserved, but we learn from the context that the heroes were successful in slaying Kumbaba. In the sixth tablet, which relates the story of Ishtar's love for Gilgamesh and the slaying of the sacred bull, victory again waits on the arms of the heroes. But here, nevertheless, we have the key to the misfortunes which later befall them. On his return to Arek, after the destruction of Kumbaba, Gilgamesh was loudly acclaimed, doffing the soil and blood-stained garments he had worn during the battle. He robed himself as befitting, a monarch and a conqueror. Ishtar beheld the king in his regal splendor, the flowers of victory still fresh on his brow and her heart went out to him in love. In moving and seductive terms, she besought him to be her bridegroom, promising that if he would enter her house in the gloom of the cedar, all manner of good gifts would be his, his flocks and herds would increase, his horses and oxen would be without rival. The river Euphrates would kiss his feet, and kings and princes would bring tribute to him. But Gilgamesh, knowing something of the past history of this capricious goddess, rejected her advances with scorn, and he began to revile her. He taunted her too with her treatment of her former lovers, of Tammuz, the bridegroom of her youth, to whom she clung weepingly year after year, of Alalu, the eagle, of Ahon, perfect in might, 
and a horse glorious in battle. Of the shepherd Tabolo, and of Asul Anu, the gardener of her father. All of which she had mocked and ill-treated in a cruel fashion, and Gilgamesh perceived that like treatment would be also meted out to him, should he accept the love of Ishtar. The deity was greatly enraged at the repulse, and mounted up to heaven. Moreover, Ishtar went before Anu, her father. O oh, my father has kept watch on me. Gilgamesh has encountered my garlands and my girdles. Underlying the story of Ishtar's love for Gilgamesh, there is evidently a nature myth of some sort, perhaps a springtime myth. Gilgamesh, the sun god, or the hero who has taken over his attributes, is wooed by Ishtar, the goddess of fertility, the great mother goddess who presides over springtime vegetation. In the rectangle of her former love affairs, we find mention of the Tammuz myth in which Ishtar slew her consort, Tammuz. With other mythological fragments, it is possible that there is an astrological significance in this part of the narrative. To resume the tale, Ishtar appealed to her father and mother, Anu and Anatu, who are actually one in the same. The dark side of Anu is contained in Anatu. It is bent light, meaning that their true nature is hidden in plain sight. Ishtar is different. Ishtar appealed to her mother and father and begged Anu to create a mighty bowl and send it against Gilgamesh. Anu at first protested, declaring that if he did so, it would result in seven years of sterility on the earth. But finally he consented, and a great bull, Alu, was sent to do battle with Gilgamesh. The portion of the text which deals with the combat is mutilated, but it appears that the conflict was hot and sustained. The celestial animal finally succumbing to a sword thrust from Gilgamesh, and Ishtar looks on with anger. Then Ishtar went up onto the wall of the strong-walled Arak. She mounted to the top and she uttered a curse, saying, Cursed be Gilgamesh, who has provoked me to anger, and has slain the great bull from heaven. Then Iabani incurs the anger of the deity. When Iabani heard the words of Ishtar, he tore out the entrails of the bull and cast them before her, saying, I will conquer thee, and I will do to thee, even as I have done to him. Ishtar was beside herself with rage. Gilgamesh and his companion dedicated the great horns of the bull to the sun god, and having washed their hands in the river Euphrates, returned once more to Arak. When the celebration of the procession passed through the city, the people came out of their houses to honor the heroes. The remainder of the tablet is concerned with the great banquet given by Gilgamesh to celebrate his victory over the bull Alu and further visions of Iarbani. Tablet 7 and 8 are extremely fragmentary, but much of the text is preserved and open to various readings it is possible that the seventh tablet belongs a description to the underworld given to Iarbani in a dream by the temple maiden Okhot, whom he had cursed in a previous tablet, who had since died. The description answers to that given in another ancient text. The myth of Ishtar's descent into Hades embodies the popular belief concerning the underworld. Come descend with me to the house of darkness, the abode of Irkala, to the house where the enterer goes not forth, to the path whose way has no return, to the house where dwellers are deprived of light, where dust is their nourishment and earth their food. They are clothed like the birds in a garment of feathers. They see not the light, they dwell in darkness, Please take note, those would be the bird messengers, 
the first of which was Ashushu Namir, who is actually a demon in the myth of Ishtar's descent into Hades. The demon was created by Enki, supposedly to help Tammuz, but in fact releases the seven evil spirits, the Anunnaki, the wicked spirits, from their palace prison, located in the gloom of the underworld. This sinister vision appears to have been a presage of Iabani's death. Shortly afterwards, he fell ill and died. At the end of 12 days, 12 is thrice great. It would also be on the 13th day that he died. The 1-3 pattern, I believe it is symbolic. The manner of Iabani's death is uncertain. One reading of the mutilated text represents Iabani as being wounded perhaps in battle, and later succumbing to the effects of the wound. But yet in another account, makes Iobani say to his friend, I have been cursed, my friend. I shall not die as one who has been slain in battle. I believe he's been poisoned by Okhot Samkat, a sign of the flood storm weapon. The breaks in the text are responsible for the divergence. The latter reading is probably the correct one. A disease or a poison was also a curse. And of course, the ancient mother goddess, Ishtar, takes the blame. She becomes the scapegoat. Iobani has grievously offended Ishtar, the all-powerful, and the curse which has smitten him to the earth is probably hers. There is nothing to suggest that we are led to believe so. Remember there are shepherd kings. In modern folklore phraseology, he died of Juju, and the death of the hero brings the eighth tablet to a close. Tammuz, who was resurrected by allowing Samkat to enter his liver. Now we see Juju, the lotus eaters, ate and drank of the lotus, but the wine was made from Jujube and other narcotic elements, which can cause palpitations and stomachache. Genus Zizephus, Jujube is also a sedative, a hypnotic, and narcotic, which can cause palpitations and stomachache. I could suggest that the original hero figure was poisoned, sedated, and hypnotized with an affliction for the lotus flower. This figure was possibly brought into the narrative to please the people, and then removed in story, leaving only Gilgamesh, meaning that the seat of power in the people's eyes is now the throne of Gilgamesh but it was never originally his. In the ninth tablet, we find Gilgamesh mourning the loss of his friend. The next part will be on the Flood Myth, and I remind you that the Divine Storm Bird, the original bird messenger, is the ultimate weapon of the Anunnaki, the Flood Storm Weapon. And only Gilgamesh is warned of its coming. In another account, it is Marduk, Ninurta, who uses the Flood Storm weapon. Utnapishtim, Marduk, and Ninurta are all saved from this Flood Storm weapon. They may all be the Son of God. Triune, Trinity, specifically meaning three in one. The term God depends on perspective. There is a version B translation on Gilgamesh and Huwawa which is a variant of Kumbaba, and is as follows. By the life of my own mother, Ninsun, and of my father, Holy Lugal Banda, my personal god. Yet another name for the divine storm bird is Lugal Banda. So it is quite possible that the great bull of heaven possibly appears reformed and renamed in new accounts defeating his former self, because humanity keeps waking up don't we? Zoo, Anzu, Perzuzu, which means multiplied imitation, Zamizu, Dug Gaam. The reason I have displayed this is the Z or Dug, an incantation from the old Babylonian period, 1830 to 1531 BC, defines the Udug as the one who, from the beginning, was not called by name, the one who never appeared with a form which only appears to lurk in the shadows. This means it does not lurk in the shadows. It would be Gilgamesh, and the mythical entity entwined with him. 
The nothingness can never be proved or denied. It is the perfect scapegoat. It is the fantasy side of your brain that may be keeping it alive. For we dare not meet a powerful challenge at odds and split asunder. <laughs> Please hit that notification bell to ensure that you are notified of each upload. Share, like, comment and subscribe to support the channel for more M7 documentaries. <laughs>